so glad you're all joining us tonight. Um, and thank you again so much to Senator Golden and Representative Agello for joining us as well. We're very excited to have you. Uh, like Nicole said, my name is Hannah Stern. I'm the policy associate at the ACLU of Rhode Island. And I am one of our two staff lobbyists along with our executive director, Stephen Brown. Uh, we also have a wonderful group of volunteers and board members who lobby on some bills with us, us which is extremely helpful with the perspective of the numbers that I'm about to show you. So just to provide some context, uh, the number of bills that we tracked or kept an eye on because they had potential implications for civil liberties during the 2021 Rhode Island legislative session was over a thousand bills. So we tracked 1,040 bills during the session. And of those 1,040 bills, we lobbied on a pretty hefty percentage of those. So this session, we lobbied on 386 pieces of legislation. Um, and I bring this up because I think it's just really helpful to show how broad the work we do is, and also to emphasize that while this presentation is pretty comprehensive and it goes over a lot of our work, uh, there's still a lot that we weren't able to fit in. Um, and we'll give you uh, more information about how you can find more about our work at the end of this session. Um, and you know, as much as we would love for this wrap up to be a huge marathon event, a 16 hours long presentation where we take you through every bill in excruciating detail, uh, we've instead prepared kind of a highlight reel for you all tonight of the 2021 session. So I'm gonna start and kick it off by talking about what I think is a particularly pertinent issue in the last year, which is legislation having to do with privacy. So the first bill has to do with medical records privacy. Um, generally speaking, the ACLU maintains that one of the most important tenets of pretty much any privacy policy is that if something or some system has implications for the personal information about someone, or if that system shares personal data, these systems should allow for an opt-in rather than an opt-out procedure for individuals. Uh, and what that means is that for someone's information to be entered in that system, uh, that individual should be, a, should be able to affirmatively opt into inclusion rather than being automatically included and forced to go through the process of opting out. Uh, the Rhode Island Health Insurance Exchange is one of those systems which stores healthcare and medical information in a statewide database. And we oppose this legislation, which changed the opt in provision for this exchange into an opt out provision instead, which we argue just really decenters patient privacy and autonomy. Um, unfortunately, this bill did pass, which we believe inappropriately puts the onus of responsibility on the patient to determine the privacy that they want to maintain over their personal health data, but we'll be keeping an eye on it. Uh, the second bill, bill, which is especially relevant, I think, with the prevalence that virtual education rose to during the course of this pandemic, um, and will likely be a staple of education in years to come, um, is a bill that unfortunately died in committee last year. Uh, this legislation would have statutorily provided all students some privacy protections while they're doing schoolwork on a computer with provisions which would have provided a prohibition on remote access to the camera and microphone and location information um, of a school loan device by school or school officials. Uh, this legislation is particularly important because of virtual education, but also because students in Rhode Island are really only afforded a patchwork of privacy protections that is dependent solely on what district they happen to be a student in while they're using these devices. Uh, last year, we actually looked at the policies for every single district in Rhode Island and found that a majority do not explicitly prohibit remote access by the school or school officials in the ways that this bill would have prevented. So this legislation is one that we're really going to be pushing in the upcoming session. Um, so while we did have some disappointing outcomes with some privacy related bills, we also saw a lot of really incredible victories with some really important equal protection legislation spanning from gender equality to uh, the rights of immigrants and to the rights of formerly incarcerated individuals. So I'll ask Senator Golden to start us off with those. And um, thank you for being here again, Senator. Uh, thank you, Hannah. It's my pleasure. And I um, certainly uh, want to emphasize how much legislation there is that you have to track and um, how helpful it is that you do so, you know, particularly um, during COVID, uh, because of the way that we have structured the legislative session, particularly in the Senate, where we have done um, pretty much everything in virtual hearings, which has been good in the sense that more people have been able to um, 
call in to be able to provide testimony and it's a little bit more predictable in terms of your ability to provide testimony, um, there has been less ability for us as legislators to drop into other committee hearings. So often times when we are all physically in the same building and hearings were going on at the same time, if I saw that there was a bill in committee that I thought, oh, this might be a civil liberties issue, you know, I'd pop in and hear the testimony. And that was just far more complicated to do this year. So it was so important to have ACLUs um, keeping a keen eye on everything that was going on in every single committee, as always. Um, so first bill that we have before us is a gender rating bill. And this is a bill that um, was led by Senator Sosnowski on the Senate side and had been introduced and passed by the Senate many, many, many times. I can't, I think every, pretty much since I've been in office. So since 2013, at, at least, um, pro, it may, may have predated that because it was certainly inspired by the ACA. You know, Rhode, Rhode Island has a lot of provisions of the ACA um, predated the ACA in our state law. And so there were some protections already in state law, but what we didn't have was um, the part of the ACA that bans the increased costs of health insurance depending on gender. And so that did predate the ACA. It was more expensive for women to get health insurance. Um, and so the ACA stopped that from happening and this allows it to be in state law to ensure that no matter what happens federally, that will continue to be a protection that we'll see in Rhode Island. Thank you, Senator. And then I'm going um, I believe you're talking about equal pay as well. Your amazing legislation, which passed this year. <laughs> Thank you. And this was another bill that the ACA, that the ACLU just was so helpful in um, thinking through how to advocate for and um, what language in the, the bill language and all, all of that um, expertise that went into this. You know, today, August 3rd is Black Women's Equal Pay Day, which means that today is the day that Black women must work into the year in order to earn what a white man earned last year. So that's 214 more days into the year that a Black woman must work in order to be the equivalent pay of a white man's 365 days. Obviously, that is a significant problem, and no one bill alone is going to address that. That is about significant gaps in the way we do um, paid leave and child care and minimum wage and other anti-discrimination laws. But the Fair Pay Act, uh, as we passed it in Rhode Island, will be a significant step forward to addressing both the racial and gender wage gap. Um, this law protects not just uh, pay deferential based on gender. It will also include all the protected classes in state law. Uh, so that's really important because it gets at some of the more complicated, more nuanced ways in which women of color are even more um, disadvantaged in pay. Um, this is a collaborative effort of many organizations, including Working Families Party and uh, Women's Fund of Rhode Island. We received technical assistance as well from the National Women's Law Center in DC, um, our Department of Labor and Training and the Rhode Island Coalition of Human Rights. We're very involved in structuring this in a way that we can make sure that we are providing as much opportunity as possible to enforce this law. Um, it basically does a few different things. It changes the standard from equal pay um, to being about discrimination to being comparable pay. And here's why that matters. You know, our equal pay laws were written in the 1950s. Rhode Island was actually one of the first ones in the country to pass an equal pay, but obviously the uh, workplace is very different than it was in 1956. We aren't talking about two people standing on a factory line. We're talking about managers who might have uh, each oversee 10 people, but they are have slightly different titles. Um, we needed to be able to modernize the way that we described what work was in order to compare what those wages are. There are a few other categories that go into that explanation of, of that comparable um, standard. You know, another really big thing that we did was um, eliminate the practice of 
using salary history to figure out what your wages should be. You should get paid what the job is worth being paid um, or what your what in the free market, a job that is categorized as that would be paying anybody. It shouldn't be based on what your um, previous salary was. This is particularly important because for women because that's a, such a compounding factor. You know, you take a couple years out of the labor market for caregiving purposes or you started your salary lower to begin with because you already were faced with gender discrimination the second you walked out of um, high school or college into the labor market. And that just compounds it if we continue to base salary on, on salary history. So that is one of the things that really tackles. And another thing that I think is really key um, measure that is in this bill is eliminating the ability for employers to prevent people from talking about their salaries uh, until this law goes into effect. It was perfectly legal in Rhode Island to have your employer uh, require you to sign a non-disclosure agreement or other confidentiality agreements that would not allow you to tell any of your coworkers what you earn. And the real problem with that lack of transparency is that has historically been how women have figured out that their salaries are so much lower is frankly a male colleague tells them uh, what they're earning and that's when they think figure out there's a pro problem with that. So that along with eliminating salary history, along with creating more transparency on what the wage um, provisions are for hiring in a job or if you get promoted, um, and then really much stronger language on how to enforce it is what this law will do. Great, thank you so much, Senator, and congratulations again on um, the passing of that bill. Uh, so. Now we're going to talk about some important equal protection legislation that concerns the rights of immigrants, and I'll pass uh, it over to our executive director, Stephen Brown, to talk about those. Uh, thank you, Hannah, and thank you, everybody, for uh, joining in this uh, presentation. Uh, this actually was a very good year for immigrants' rights. Um, it's the first uh, year in many years where that's been the case. Um, there were three very important bills that made progress this year. I'm going to briefly talk about two of them. Uh, one had to do with in-state tuition. Uh, you know, there are many undocumented immigrants who come here when they were little children. Um, they stay here, they go to our schools, uh, and yet um, when it's time for them to go to college, um, state law did not uh, treat them as in-state residents. Uh, and as you probably know, there's a very significant difference in tuition costs depending on whether you are a resident of Rhode Island or are from out of state. We're talking about thousands of dollars difference in how you categorize an individual going to well, one of the state colleges or URI. Uh, and this year, uh, the General Assembly passed a law making very clear um, that if uh, you are, um, you've been in Rhode Island, you've gone to high school in Rhode Island, you meet other neutral criteria, the fact that you're an undocumented immigrant doesn't turn you into an out-of-state resident for tuition purposes. So this is really important. It means that immigrants who are here can go to a local college, can stay here, can contribute, continue to contribute. Um, it was a very positive step uh, that the General Assembly took, and, and we were very pleased after a number of years to see this bill finally pass. Um, the second bill I want to briefly talk about is one that's been around literally for almost two decades. Uh, it's a bill to uh, guarantee undocumented immigrants the ability to obtain a driver's license. Um, that used to be the case uh, until uh, the early 2000s when then Governor Carcieri reversed a policy that was in effect and, and banned undocumented immigrants from being able to get a driver's license. Um, what's really worthwhile noting is how many different organizations and, and entities support giving them driver's licenses. A police departments strongly believe it's important uh, for undocumented immigrants to have licenses because it's a public safety issue. Um, if you're, they're getting a license, it means they've had driver's training. It means they're carrying insurance. Um, they don't have to feel they have to flee anytime they're stopped by a police officer. Um, it, it really is very important for public safety. Um, this year, uh, the Senate for the first time passed a bill um, that would allow undocumented immigrants to get driver's licenses. Unfortunately, it died in the House. 
Um, but uh, it was a very big step. Uh, and I'm feeling fairly confident that uh, by this time next year, uh, we'll be talking about how Rhode Island has passed the law to um, allow undocumented immigrants to get driver's licenses and join 16 or 17 other states that already do that. Great, thank you so much, Steve. Um, and then I'm now very glad to introduce Representative Agello, who will be giving us some information about um, one of her really important uh, pieces of legislation that passed this year that we're really excited about. Uh, so Representative Agello. <laughs> I believe you're on mute, Representative. First of all, thank you. And I wanna echo um, Senator Golden's words about the expansiveness and depth of the work that um, our lobbyists, both paid staff, uh, Steve and Hannah and volunteer staff do in um, informing us all about the legislation before us. Finding the unintended consequences and all of that is, it's just invaluable. And so for anybody who's listening, I really want people to hear that. Uh, this bill, um, <laughs> uh, removes from Rhode Island licensing law, the phrase crime of moral turpitude. For decades, a whole range of licenses granted by state entities um, could not be granted if someone was deemed guilty of the crime of moral turpitude. This was in addition to being guilty of a felony and in addition to all sorts of other qualifications about the person, it was, it's, it's moral turpitude is a vague and um, redundant phrase. And potentially the, um, the law could have made it impossible for people with a, perhaps a, a, a misdemeanor record to get a license. And, and now I'm going to read to you the list of licenses that um, had this language in there. There are 30 some. I sort of lose count when I try and count them. But accountants, private security guards, engineers, land surveyors, veterinarians, chiropractors, podiatrists, dentists, dental hygienists, medical personnel, uh, those practicing acupuncture and oriental medicine, occupational therapists, speech pathologists and audiologists, hearing aid dealers and fitters, landscape architects, cesspool designers, athletic trainers, um, telephone sales solicitors. I didn't even know that they had to have a license. Home inspectors, chemical um, Chemical, de chem chemical dependency um, people, um, uniform athlete sales, medical waste generators, transporters, explosive technicians and uh, dealers, um, off-track betting, employees, state lottery sales agents, police and fire personnel. All of those people could be disallowed from hiring. If, if someone thought that they were guilty of the crime of moral turpitude, which our courts haven't been able to satisfactorily define. And as I said, it could be a way of um, kind of undermining our attempt to ban the box and, and by that um, open up employment opportunities for people who have the training to be, I don't know, cesspool designers. And um, someone decides that they're guilty of moral turpitude. It was very interesting hearing the discussion in committee. And um, in the end, uh, conservatives and progressives and and all voted for the bill. So 
thank you to Steve and Hannah and the folks at ACLU for pushing this forward and putting it in my hands. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Rep. Um, and thank you, thank you for reading that list. I feel like it really puts the importance of your legislation in perspective. So thank you again for your sponsorship of that bill and congratulations on its passage. Um, so we're now going to turn to a new set of bills about another very important issue, which is free speech. Um, I think that the bills in this section are particularly interesting because they really do show the breadth of how free speech issues show up in our legislation. So I'm going to ask Steve to start us off on that topic by talking about two bills related to this issue. Uh, thanks again, Hannah. Uh, the two bills I'm going to talk about to start this topic are both bills that were put in by the Attorney General, uh, designated civil rights bills. Um, but bills that we had really serious concerns about in terms of their free speech implications. Um, while both bills passed the Senate, uh, they died in the House, uh, so we're happy about that. Um, although I expect that they will be back next year and we'll be fighting them again. Um, the first one uh, amended uh, Rhode Island's current hate crimes law. Uh, we have a statute that allows for enhanced sentencing if a person commits a crime and it's motivated by some discriminatory reason, you know, because of sex, race, uh, religion, and so on. Uh, the bill that the Attorney General put in this year tried to expand the statute in a few ways. First, it added, a it added new categories um, of what constituted discriminatory conduct to include um, uh, crimes committed that were motivated on, on the basis of a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, and then it also expanded um, how the attorney general could prove a crime um, so it was easier to prove that a hate crime uh, was committed. Uh, we opposed the hate crime statute when it was first passed. We were concerned about its potential implications for freedom of speech. Um, and uh, just as importantly, we were concerned that it's one of the few statutes in Rhode Island law that actually has a mandatory sentencing provision. Um, if you are convicted of this crime, you must serve a minimum amount of time in prison. Uh, and so for that reason, we've also opposed it. Um, so we raised these arguments uh, against the bill. Uh, I think what was very uh, interesting and important was that even though a major aspect of this bill was to uh, expand hate crimes to cover crimes on the basis of uh, sexual orientation and gender uh, identity, um, it was the LGBTQ community that actually came out strongly against the legislation as well, along with us. And they were concerned about seeing the attorney general promote a carceral approach, a punitive approach using incarceration to address these very deep systemic discrimination issues. Uh, they felt as we did that there were other better ways to address it. And I think it was you know, thanks to their concerns about uh, you know, the whole carceral issue um, that, the bill, that the bill died. And, and we're hopeful that that uh, will, will happen again next year. Uh, this is, you know, discrimination is a terrible, uh, deep-seated problem, but you shouldn't necessarily look to the criminal law as the way to deal with that, and, and we're glad that that bill did not end up passing. Um, uh, the second bill, uh, again, designated as a civil rights bill, um, expanded the powers uh, of an individual in the Attorney General's office who's called the, the civil rights advocate, uh, who's supposed to, to investigate hate crimes, other types of uh, uh, misconduct. Um, and this bill broadly expanded the powers this advocate had so that in conducting non-criminal investigations, um, this advocate could summon for interrogation any person who might have any information about potential unlawful activities and compel that person to disclose whatever they knew or else face up to a $10,000 sanction um, or a contempt of court. And you know, the, the mischief that would, could occur with giving an individual that sort of power is just enormous. Um, one example uh, that comes to mind is uh, the disturbance that took place in downtown Providence last June during the George Floyd protests. You know, there was a police car set on fire. Uh, this bill would have allowed uh, the attorney general to have any individual who was at that protest come in answer any questions they knew about any conduct that anybody at that protest took um, or else face a $10,000 fine. Um, 
Uh, we were joined by a number of other organizations, uh, community organizations opposing the bill because of those concerns. And again, as uh, just like the other bill, um, it died on the House side. Uh, I do expect it to uh, come up again next year, but you know, we will be very active in trying uh, to keep both of these bills uh, out of the general laws. Great, thank you so much, Steve. Um, so next I would like to ask Senator Golden again to uh, speak about a bill which carves out a very broad and concerning exception to the First Amendment. Yeah, so um, <laughs> this is one of those, uh, for those of you who follow along on the legislative session and how it all happens, this is, there tends to always be some surprising twists and turns in the last day or two of legislative session. And this was one of those bills that um, came out of committee in the Senate, uh, I think uh, the last day or the day before the last day and was one of the bills that was um, voted on, I think the last day on the Senate floor uh, without having much attention ever being paid to it before in the Senate. Um, and so this was, you know, caught several of us by surprise. Um, and so I spoke about it on the Senate floor that night, um, which is, you know, I'm not, I actually, I'm not one that usually gives very lengthy speeches on the Senate floor, but I was really disturbed to see that this bill was coming to the Senate floor and going to make it to the governor's desk. Um, essentially what it does is it creates this new category of child erotica and the language that defines it is very vague. Um, you, the pictures are anybody eight, under 18 years old, anybody who's over 18 can be convicted of possession of child erotica. You're fully clothed in um, these pictures, and it could be, and it's not just pictures, it's any medium, social media, Snapchat, Instagram, could be, um, you know, any, any social media platform. Um, and these are, you know, supposedly minors are partially closed, which could, could mean that you're at the beach and, uh, not wearing a shirt with your bathing suit or the straps are down or whatever. It's all very vague. But the largest problem about this is it's actually not about the harm to the person that's in the picture, but rather what the thoughts are of the person looking at the picture. And that to me was completely disturbing because it's really, you could look at, two people could look at the same picture and one person, um, is going to be convicted for something that is defined as sexual sexual gratification um, without even really knowing what that means and exactly what actions needs to be taken for, in order to be for that to be defined. You know, what this stemmed from was that there was a case that was overturned by the Rhode Island Supreme Court in which the state police had um, tried convicting somebody of child pornography, but their initial search warrant was incorrectly done. And so this was a way to try and, I, I think, not that this was the testimony ever given, this is just my perception of what was happening, um, trying to correct for an error they made themselves. You know, certainly I would not want to see any harm done to children and would want uh, us to have stronger laws if they're needed that would protect children. But ultimately what this bill does, particularly because it actually is completely not, you know, it's written in a way that a 17 year old could Snapchat their 18 year old partner and suddenly the 18 year old is, um, potentially going to serve a, a year in jail. And so that to me is that we were com criminalizing normal behavior among teenagers to begin with. And there's absolutely no exception in the way this law is drafted to protect against that. Um, you know, many of my colleagues were like, oh, well, that's never going to happen. You know, 
I, I, I can only vote on the, the language that's in front of me, and I can't guess how an attorney general may, may or may not, or a prosecutor may or may not use that law to their advantage to get somebody to um, plead to something else or whatever. I don't know what they're going to do with it. I can only vote on the language that's in front of me, and I found the language of that bill to be extraordinarily troubling. Um, again, um, Youth Pride, GLAD, LGBT Action all came out uh, with ACLU in opposition to this because, of course, the thing that we absolutely worry about the most is without that clear language uh, about teenagers, you could completely see an opportunity for non-supportive parents um, of children who are seeing each other and are in, you know, in a, in, in the LGBT community and parents who will try and use that against their child or to harm, harm their partner in some way um, could be used in a retaliatory way. And even if nothing ever happens of it and they are just get a phone call from the police, that is pretty damaging to a teenager psyche um, just for doing what is totally normal behavior. So this is like a huge net of taking some stuff that might be problematic and throwing it in with some totally normal behavior and criminalizing it all in one big package. Thank you so much, Senator Golden. That was a that was a very great uh, description of why this bill was so concerning and why it's really concerning that it passed. Um, so I'll briefly cover this next bill, which is a piece of legislation that I think really gained uh, some national notoriety this last year. Uh, many of you have probably heard about the prohibition on the teaching of uh, quote unquote divisive concepts bill, which was introduced in many, many, many state legislatures this year, and which would have effectively tried to ban the teaching of extremely important topics like sexism or institutional racism. Uh, we opposed this bill. Not only was the bill's language so vague that it would have been virtually unenforceable, but it was really also a direct assault on free speech and academic freedom. And it would have really inappropriately tried to quash some very important lessons around the systemic issues that we see in both our contemporary and historical institutions. So thankfully this bill was summarily rejected in committee. Um, and luckily it does not seem to be a concern in Rhode Island, unlike other states which have passed similar bills to this. Uh, so that concludes the section on free speech. Uh, the next set of bills that we have to talk about are bills which I think represents one of the disappointments of this session for many, which is that there was very little substantive action on police reform. So I'll go over the first bill. Um, one of those bills was a piece of legislation which would have renewed the Comprehensive Community Police Relationship Act, which expired in July 2020 and which required the collection and analysis of traffic stop data from all municipal and state police departments. Um, and specifically analysis to see if those traffic stops were, were showing racial disparities. Um, and despite the finding of consistent racial disparities in the manner in which traffic stops were being conducted in this data, uh, the legislation was not renewed. And this is unfortunate not only because of the important provisions that were in the law already, but because we pushed for several amendments to the law, which would have really um, bolstered the provisions in this statute. It would have created a community review board for this data. It would have included even stricter data collection requirements for police departments. So this is a bill that unfortunately died in committee, but we will definitely continue past pushing for this bill, um, even though it didn't pass this session. Uh, but another area that unfortunately did not see any past legislation was police transparency. So I would like to ask uh, Representative Agello to speak about the legislation she sponsored, a very important bill uh, concerning open records requests and police misconduct records. Oh, Rep, you're on mute. <laughs> Okay, police misconduct got um, some more attention this year, actually a lot more attention. And um, we, we were made to think again about the LIABOR and um, the law enforcement officer's ability to police themselves, it seems. And uh, 
the attorney general has determined that the results of um, internal investigations are not necessarily public. Um, we've also had trouble getting the public to be able to see the results, the um, body camera footage and um, actually pedestrian um, uh, witness um, telephone filming video of um, police activities. And it, were it not for the um, really her heroic action of my colleague, Jose Batiste in releasing the uh, video of um, Sergeant Hanley's um, beating of um, um, a person who was under arrest on the ground on their stomach um, and handcuffed, um, hitting him on the back of the head and the back and his legs and um, we saw all, all of that, um, might not have seen it if um, Jose Batiste then working for the um, um, Civilian Review Board for the City of Providence had not determined that this was important for the public to see and he um, lost his job as a result. He's still a representative and, and a fine advocate, but anyhow, um, there have been other issues coming up this year since the Hanley issue um, incident. And this legislation would, would say that um, the Access to Public Records Act includes the results of internal investigations, whether the internal investigation was taken up as a request by the public or for internal reasons with the, with the police. And um, it would just require that the results be made public with personally identifying information redacted when that was appropriate. But um, it, it, it's interesting that when we have a hearing on something like this in, in committee, in the Judiciary Committee in the House, um, nobody testifies against it. Everybody seems to be for it. The one, one um, suggested limit on this that someone that came from someone who wasn't part of the hearing process was that perhaps we should amend the, the um, legislation to say that the results would be made public after the investigation was complete. Um, that may be risky in, in terms of if the police decide they're never gonna declare it complete, we never get to see it. Um, for information was that it, it might make um, prosecuting or continuing the investigation more difficult. I think in the Hanley case where Jose Batiste had released the video of, of that incident, um, he was still convicted of misdemeanor only, but still convicted. Um, didn't seem to be a problem with the conviction. So anyhow, that's something that we'll come back on next year. I in, intend to and um, will advocate for and either on its own right or as part of some real rewrite of Leobor, the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. Thank you so we much. For these people to oh. carry guns and protect us and let them police themselves. Doesn't make sense. Yeah. Thank you so much, Representative Jill. And you actually um, gave me the perfect transition to our next bill, which Steve will be speaking on, which is the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights, um, or Leobor, um, as it's uh, also called. <laughs> Steve. Uh, thanks again. And yes, Rep, uh, you did give me a good introduction to this. Uh, Rhode Island is one of about a dozen states that has one of these laws known as LEABOR, um, which provides enormous protections to police officers before they can be disciplined by their police chiefs. Uh, now, the ACLU strongly supports due process for government employees, including police. Um, but the uh, protections that LEABOR provides are really extraordinary. Um, they're much more protective than 
uh, the rights that any other government employee has uh, when they face potential discipline. And it's a real concern because it means it's extremely difficult for police chiefs to act and address misconduct by police, including you know, instances of a, a use of force unnecessarily against civilians. Um, so there were a number of bills introduced this year to try to address that. There were a few bills that sought to repeal the entire statute. Uh, there were others that sought to reform it in various ways, uh, such as giving uh, police chiefs a greater discretion to uh, impose discipline uh, suspensions uh, without having to go through this very complicated procedural process that Leobor otherwise requires. Um, unfortunately, this, uh, like the other police reform bills we've talked about, uh, this one did not pass. However, um, you know, the talk is, is that conversations are going on behind the scenes, uh, and it's possible that this is a bill that will come up if the General Assembly comes back for a fall session uh, in September or October. Um, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Um, you know, we have been pushing for uh, strong reforms in the bill, um, depending on how the bill looks. So we may end up not supporting it or strongly supporting it. Um, but uh, this is another one, I think, where if something doesn't pass in the fall, I think we will see some legislation pass next year because I think everybody realizes that the legislature needs to do something you know, the police reform is is at the forefront of a lot of people's concerns, and um, I'm hopeful that uh, within the next year we'll see some uh, forward movement on this issue. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, and so we're going to transition to our final topic today, which I think is also especially important, uh, considering that the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, has really changed a lot about the way um, as Senator Golden spoke about earlier, that we're able to interact with our governmental bodies. So we're just going to close by talking about a bit of open government legislation which came up this session. Uh, the first bill is one which cropped up pretty early in the session. It was a provision included in the Senate rules which gives committee chairs pretty broad discretion to require any witness to testify under oath. Uh, we opposed this provision saying that it would really chill the free speech rights of members of the public who wish to testify. Um, and unfortunately this rule did pass, but it's one that we're gonna keep a really close eye on into the future. Um, and speaking of testifying, I'd like to throw it to Representative Agello to speak a bit about um, how governmental bodies meeting remotely came up during this session. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, le legislation was introduced at the behest of the Department of Business Regulation um, that would enshrine in law ways that, um, that were developed for the legislature to meet during the pandemic. And there were three phases. There was were entirely virtual, where none of the members of the public body were in person. Everyone was um, participating virtually. And then there was a hybrid model where some people were participating in person and others participating virtually. And then back to the way we've been in the past with everybody being able to participate in person. Uh, the legislation went through a number of different um, modifications. And um, I, I just first want to talk a little bit about what was good and what was not so good about the way the House um, operated during, the pan during this spring session. Uh, we held meetings um, in, 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 the, in the Vets Auditorium for a while, and then we got back to the State House. We had some committee meetings that were um, possibly virtual or in person, and then, and then gradually we got to most of the committee members being present in person. 
though they could participate virtually. Um, but the public never got back into being participating other than by telephone. Members of the public had to call ahead of time and register that they wanted to testify on a particular bill. And then they would be called and get their opportunity to say their piece. But they didn't have the advantage of members of the public didn't have the advantage of being sitting in the room and watching the discussion, the back and forth, perhaps hearing something that someone else said about a bill and, and being able to incorporate that into what they said. Um, the committee didn't have, at least in my experience, didn't ever have the, the ability to go back to someone once they testified because of something someone else said later and, and go back and say, Hannah, can you clarify what you were talking about with this, with your concerns about virtual, entirely virtual meetings, for instance. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that ability. We didn't have the ability to see people's faces and the people testifying didn't have the ability to see committee members' faces as they were talking or see if we were even paying attention. Um, one of the good things that happened was that the House, and I, th I hope this will continue, all submitted written testimony was um, put up on the internet, on the General Assembly's website in a committee document session, section. So you can go to a particular bill that was heard, for instance, on in the Judiciary Committee, and you can read all the committed, all the submitted testimony. That was helpful to me because I could read submitted testimony on Sunday afternoon at home, as opposed to having to find a time when I could go to the commit the office in the state house and get the pull out the file and read the testimony. Um, but it's also, I think, really helpful to the public and a part of that open government. Uh, to get back to this legislation. So I hope that that committee documents section on the General Assembly website that's it, available now for House committee meetings. I hope that that will continue into the fall and future sessions, because I think that's really a good improvement to transparency. Um, as regards this um, legislation allowing a variety of different sorts of meetings. The legislation has a two-year time frame, so it would be in effect until July, I believe, of 2023, so two years from now, essentially. And it would allow committees, um, public bodies, um, school, city council, school committees, um, zoning boards to meet entirely virtually. Mm -hmm. um, so no one in the room in city hall or wherever where the city council or the school committee normally meets, no one in the room, everybody meeting via Zoom and, and anyone from the public wanting to testify, testifying over the phone, um, but with the limitations that that provides or um, a hybrid in which the public body is there or some of them are there and others aren't and the public is not there or the public can be there and can be um, can be uh, available to testify over the phone or some other way. Um, or back to the way we're used to with public bodies and people testifying in person and the whole thing being in person. The problem that um, the ACLU pointed out and I think is really important is that there would be nothing stopping a public body from, from continuing to meet entirely virtually, none of them ever being in the council chambers in Providence City Hall. Of until July of 2023, or the Providence City Council or the Providence School Committee could meet 
in their normal meeting place in person, but no public members could, um, could, could be present. Public mem members would only be able to participate virtually. And that, that's, as Steve said, it's, it's alarming that people could go two years without encountering their city council person in person in that city council chamber. Um, that just, we, we don't have any reason to think that's necessary, but this legislation would have allowed that. Uh, the legislation, um, as I said, went through a number of changes. It ultimately passed in the House, but died in the Senate. And I, you know, it, it may be back in the fall. There may be people that really want to, um, to do something like this. But it was concerning. Great. Thank you so much, Representative Agello. Um, so the last topic that uh, we're going to talk about that didn't get addressed this session but has to do with open government is election reform and how the conduction of elections could change really to better center voter rights. So Steve, will you close out our legislative summaries for us? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, this past year, because of the pandemic, we saw lots of changes in the ways in the way people voted. Um, there were all sorts of uh, different uh, methods. Um, if you look at the statistics, um, as a result of the pandemic, um, there were about a third of the people who still went to the polls uh, last year. There were a third of the people who voted by mail ballot, and there were about a third of the people who did early voting. They were able to go to their local uh, board of canvassers and um, mark their ballot uh, ahead of uh, actual election day. And it worked extremely well. Um, the problem is, is that these were all done uh, uh, by executive orders and those executive orders have expired. And what this uh, legislation was designed to do that we strongly supported um, was to make those permanent. Um, you know, there are a number of provisions in the bill, but the one that I would emphasize is one that we went all the way to the United States Supreme Court on. And that's a state statutory requirement for mail ballots that requires individuals who want to vote that way to have their... Um, to have their uh, voting witnessed uh, either by two, two people or by a notary public. Um, that's an enormous burden um, for a lot of people. And uh, as a result of eliminating it this past year, we saw an incredible increase uh, in the number of people who made use of mail ballots. Uh, this bill is designed to ensure that that can continue. Um, and it was unfortunate that the bill did not pass this session. Um, uh, the, there's a group called Let Rhode Island Vote um, that we are part of that is pushing very hard to try to get this bill back on the agenda of come September, uh, because we think that it's important to have election reform legislation passed in a non-election year. If you try to do it next year, it will get tied up with a lot of politics. Um, so uh, we are working very hard uh, to see if we can get this legislation enacted in September. Uh, if anybody's interested in this issue, I encourage you to go to the website of Let, Let Rhode Island Vote. It's, L, it's letrivote.org, um, and there'll be lots of information about how you can contact your legislators and urge them to make this a priority. Um, so it remains a very big issue for us. Again, we're hopeful that it will end up uh, in a positive way, um, but uh, it will take the work of a lot of people, including those of you who are listening in, uh, to help us with that. So with that, I'll uh, hand it back. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, so that concludes the legislative uh, summary portion. Um, thank you again, Senator Golden, and thank you so much, Representative Agello, for, um, for speaking with us about those really important bills. And speaking of websites and information, I just want to briefly provide some information about the real wealth of information that's available on our affiliates website. Um, we have information about lobbying. Here are just a few of the things that you can find on our website that can teach you um, a lot of different information about Advocacy 101 and navigating the state house. Um, we have a very comprehensive Know Your Rights section on our website, which can be very helpful for reference. And then we also have a very, very, very comprehensive um, legislative portion of our website, which goes over of the 386 bills we lobby on every year, we uh, we choose which we think are the most important for you to know about, and we put those on our website. 
Um, there are a lot of those up there. So if you have any, if, if you have any interest in learning more about what happened during the legislative session, there's uh, again a wealth of information available on our website that goes beyond.